Okay, so thank you for being here. Um, Tyson, James has joined us as a guest speaker. Um, Tyson, we usually open with a, I usually open with a little bit of gratitude. And so today I'd just like to share gratitude for the work that you do. It's been inspiring to, well, to put this course together and to think about whose voices um, I would like to have here to share with the class and people who are championing and providing so much for so many people in so many ways. Um, and I know that it's really hard to run a small business these days and you've been through so much, not just with COVID, but with all the ion construction for years before that and the community leadership that you've been providing, you know, putting forth values of environmental integrity and prioritizing you no know, decent wages for your workers and conditions and caring and supporting for less fortunate folks in your community in a lot of different ways. We're going to hear later, I think, about the community fridge, and I posted something about that for students to look at as well. And I think just also bringing people together in the neighborhood. I live not far from the um, Cafe Pyrus Outpost and uh, been I haven't been over there a lot, but a few times on Saturday mornings when you've created a sort of a mini neighborhood market there with farmers and other vendors coming and sharing, um, selling their goods. And uh, my son likes to say that a big problem for so many people uh, is just that they don't know how to eat good food. And so I also honor you for just providing good food for people, enabling that. Um, and finally, just really grateful for your time to sort of be a spokesperson for the community for, in, um, for the food service industry um, and sharing your time with us today. So it, the floor is wide open for you to take this however you'd like. Uh, well, thank you very much. That's a huge ego boost. When you sent me a message saying you'd read through a lot of the articles and things I did, I didn't realize I had a back catalog. Uh, so that, that, was, that was really nice. Uh, so if I'm sure you've posted all of these things, but my name is Tyson James. I own Cafe Pyrus. Uh, we're a little organic vegan uh, community-based cafe, uh, I guess. Really, we've been around for, it's 11 years now. We're going on our 12th year. And it started off as an idea when I was working in the corporate world because everything uh, that we did in the corporate world was pretty much profiteering industry and just taking. And I realized I would, at the end of the day, I was making money, but I was, uh, I was not fulfilled at all. And it wasn't partaking really in terms of what our community was. Uh, so somebody came to me with an idea of having this cafe and I thought, yeah, that's, that's incredible. And then I tried to do it and I realized 12 years later, uh, I really lose my corporate salary, uh, but I'm very fulfilled. So that part of it's uh, been really great. Some of you may have been there before. Uh, our motto is we will not harm the planet, uh, our employees or our customers for our profit. So for us, that really means sustainability in just about everything that we do. And you touched upon some of the things when we're talking about our community, um, the kind of food that we have, the wholesome, the healthiness, those things. But it really extends on a lot more than that. So first of all, the reason that we are a vegan cafe or vegetarian cafe was if we were to do meat sustainably uh, for a roast beef sandwich, I would have to charge you know, 25 to $30 to be profitable and carry on the traditions that we wanted to have for local organic, all the things that we should have within a sustainable food system. So that wasn't viable. Uh, when we looked at other alternatives, we were able to find suppliers like Henry's Tempeh, which is a local organic producer of a really high value protein uh, right here. And it allowed us to keep our costs down. Uh, and then that kind of spans out into everything. So some things are <clears throat> almost impossible to do. So we make some choices like things like avocados, of course, uh, are not exactly the most sustainably grown local plant. Uh, you can get them organically, you can get them from fair trade, which we try and do. But even there, we run into supply chain issues. Um, but it kind of extends into every part of our business. So yes, we have the local or, and organic food uh, system that we're trying to support. 
But then that also moves into things like uh, working with fair trade. So going to a coffee plantation, uh, we actually go out to our farms and we are, have partners with our roasters and sourcers for coffee beans. Here's another way that unfortunately workers are exploited, the land is exploited. Just about every part of that system uh, exploits somebody else. So trying to take that exploitation away and bring value back to the communities is a big part of it. And one of the best lessons I learned was having that direct impact and having that direct connection makes so much more uh, sense and more of an impact because right across, there's basically a mountain that we go to that one of our coffees has grown on. And uh, there's a dirt track that you could maybe drive a donkey down. Like there's, there's not a lot of room. And on one side, there's this wild forest of coffee trees and they go 20 feet tall. Uh, they're overbearing with fruit. The plants are, or the, the boughs are hanging over. Uh, and that is the farm that we trade with. And right across this little laneway is a Starbucks fair trade organic farm. Every one of the trees is four feet tall. It is planted like you would think of a condition or uh, a traditional North American planting system where it's very easy to harvest and cultivate, but it, it doesn't do anything for labor. It really is more environmentally, it has a bigger environmental impact and really takes away from the land there where the other side of the, 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 this roadway is just a natural plantation. And that idea that we have this international system called fair trade organic, and this is how it's producing, even within those systems can be very difficult because when you go there and you do the direct trade, uh, you can really see the difference of the impact you can make. So there's beyond the local and organic and, and you know, these organizations are really trying to do the best thing for our business as well as for our customers leads you to things like that. And then you get into, you know, our packaging. So everything we have is biodegradable, uh, mostly compostable, uh, even down to our cutlery and re-implemented that five, six years ago. And there's other people in the industry that we're still lacking behind people like um, Thompson where they have eliminated every piece of plastic. So there's still further we can go. I would say we're at nine out of 10 on that scale where a McDonald's might be one out of 10. Uh, and then you have even further pioneers like um, Thompson and uh, with the Wooden Boat Food Company that are like 11 out of 10 and do an incredible job. Um, and that of course costs your operational expenses change things like a compost program which should be second nature. It is for everybody that's here. You all have a compost program at your home. There is nothing for industry. Uh, so there are no commercial compost programs provided by the region or from uh, the city. So the tendency is just to go with whatever the cheapest thing is, it means all of that, uh, especially in a kitchen where we have so much waste, uh, all of those things are just going straight to landfill, but it takes the business owner itself to to make that uh, commitment to being sustainable. And it goes into your packaging as well. Uh, and I think the bigger part of this that we always forget about, we talk about food systems, we talk about packaging, but then we tend to miss out the community part. And to be a sustainable business within your community, you have to pay your employees fairly. So within the uh, restaurant industry, we have a split tipping system. So every person, uh, no matter the hour they work, uh, gets their their like a wage tip out on everything that they do, which I think averages about seven dollars an hour. Minimum's only ever been five, and we've done this with our pricing to make our food um, accessible for people, so you can get a local, organic, vegan specialty, all made in house uh, sandwich and a salad for thirteen dollars. Where you know you can go to McDonald's to get the same thing, and you're paying about ten. So for that 30% extra, typically you look at places that would charge $20 for about the same thing. We tried to keep that price lower. And if you can tip, great, that brings you part of that community. And then in other areas of our organization, we're fully living wage, like in our bakery where tipping isn't going to be part of that process. Uh, those people are still, they still receive tips, but it's only maybe a dollar to two an hour. So they're all at least 1650 to uh, some of them are around $20 an hour because that's sustainable for our community. And then moving beyond that are some of the other things that we do, like a community fridge. Uh, we actually support two community fridges. We host one, we fill another one every week. Uh, we have community events that we continually do. Um, and 
even beyond the parts that you would think of normally for marginalized people within the community. Uh, we also do a lot of things for arts and promoting the arts community and providing a, a spot because again, for us to be a sustainable business long-term, we, uh, we need to be part of that community where typically businesses only look at the output of being part of their community. So I will give you $100 if I can get $1,000 of advertising from it. I will let you host here if I can make $1,000 from um, all of the people that are hosting here. So we've kind of flipped that around and it's a different model. I'd love to see where it goes in 20 years if we're going to be fully a, a worker-owned co-op type operation because uh, you know, you're know you all going to take, instead of your $100,000 a year salary, you're going to go down to $24,000 a year and your profit won't be 8%, it'll be 1%, but you'll be better for the community and you'll be sustainable. It's a really hard argument to have, but it's something that we're continually trying to push because I would love to see all businesses operate more like we do. Uh, and I think that could solve some of the industrial issues that we have facing our community as well. So that's kind of about us. Uh, I am here, I guess, for a while. I can answer any questions. And uh, like I said, it's been, there are a lot of challenges that come up with this. So, you know, speaking with people like you that are going through and going to help shape this new direction, having that understanding of how it actually gets implemented is going to help us later as well. Thanks, Tyson. Um, okay, so I said to the class, bring your questions, and you've given us a bit of a smattering or a smorgasbord of, of a bunch of initiatives that you're doing. Um, maybe in particular, I'm not sure if people know about the community fridge. Do you want to just sort of outline how that's, uh, how people are using it? So uh, there's a few different organizations, and what a community fridge does is basically provide 24 hour access to food, uh, free access. So these fridges are outside. For example, there's one downtown um, at Full Circle Foods. Unfortunately, they're moving. We're not sure what's gonna happen with the fridge. Uh, and then there's another one that is hosted at our bakery at um, on the Spurline Trail. Uh, both of these fridges are community supported, meaning uh, people from the community are the ones filling it. So there is no food bank drive. There isn't a real all go to Zares and pick up their old food. This is basically people from the community taking the initiative and realizing that other people in our community uh, are facing food scarcity. Uh, so this offers an opportunity for somebody who may not have you know, a nine to five schedule, let's say, and maybe stability is a bit of an issue, but everybody's gonna be hungry. Uh, and these fridges offer an opportunity for people to go in and get fresh food. Uh, typically, pretty like at this time of year, people have an abundance of harvests in their garden. So we were seeing, you know, boxes of squash, boxes of zucchini uh, outside, like we all try and do and hide those things. Uh, but we're also seeing, you know, people from the community purchasing a bag of rice, uh, even wild rice or indigenous rice or uh having a hamper program for tarps and tents and these spaces become community spaces for people to meet and distribute their needs and this given during what's happened during covid a lot of our service organizations have become very restricted in their operation um so they basically places like the working center have had to scale back to almost a core initiative the food bank is not a public accessible um, resource anymore. Places like Healing of the Seven Generations that do food hampers are now by appointment. So a lot of people that are facing uh, marginalization may not have the ability to schedule, to meet on time, to be at a you know to to be somewhere for nine a.m. is almost impossible. And that's how these fridges help fulfill that gap. And every time we go, so the restaurant ourselves, we actually fill the fridge on Fridays. Um, and every time we go, there is a lineup there. And I know other places like Central Fresh, uh, Portese uh, are also all contributing, but I would say 80% of the food actually comes from the community. So a very interesting um, way to help meet the food scarcity uh, issues within our community, but it's being driven by the community as opposed to a large multinational corporation. So 
I, I'm going to skip on here. Somebody asked, how do you assess a sustainable wage? So we actually have, there is a living wage. Um, there is a living wage survey that happens in every community. In Waterloo region, this was as of 2019, was 1579. There's been an update, but it hasn't fully been published. It's now 1632 per hour. Uh, and their parameters for establishing a living wage is where somebody would be able to have savings, cover off their their normal wages, or sorry, their normal housing costs, as well as their normal food costs. Um, that doesn't include things like, especially in this community, being able to buy a house or to own a car that's based on public transportation. So that is the bare minimum for somebody to be able to pay rent uh, and and have a small amount of savings, maybe have an internet plan. Well, of course, have an internet plan because that's essential. Um, but that's not including, you know, any kind of clothing, any kind of um, any kind of entertainment value. So that that sixteen thirty two is the base necessity uh, that you need to be able to live, um, not live extravagant, extravagantly, not live. Uh, in comfort, but to basically make sure that you're not facing constant um, housing issues. For example, if you are in Kitchener right now, we have a huge one going on where the gentrification of the core has um, really had a huge impact on all the lower rent, um, lower rent uh, housing opportunities we had. Where houses used to have three or four apartments or might be a rooming house, uh, they are now all going to single dwellings, uh, single family dwellings. And of course, any kind of place that is rentable is being renovated, uh, which might just mean fresh paint, but any way to get the person out of that, um, out of that house or out of that home uh, so that the landlord can raise the rent. And the market here is dictating that so it's a very difficult situation. We've actually had a number of employees that have had to leave the area. Uh, and because of that housing crisis, we've lost employees. It loses your ability to be profitable um, based on this capitalist system. It also is impacting things like our arts community because if you can't live, um, I guess cheaply or you know well below your means it's very hard to dedicate your life to an arts pro like to uh, an artistic endeavor like a musician or a painter so it really is wide spanning about how we look at something that's just sustainable at 1632 where minimum wage in most of the food industry although it's 1435 we have two factors that are supported by our government one of them is to hire students so, and that is any student is now worth only thirteen forty an hour, or provide tipping, and that puts you down to twelve twenty five an hour. So, there's a new trend among coffee shops that have alcohol in them, and the reason that they have alcohol is not a sustainable business model because it's really cool. It's more because you'll pay, you'll save thirty percent on your wages over time. I've had multiple consultants come in and ask us to get a liquor license. But their biggest selling feature saying that you will save on labor, which is disgusting because a person at 9 a.m. in the morning making your coffee is not worth any less than anybody else. But the idea that they might get a tip means that you could pay them less. And unfortunately, these things are systemic within the food industry. And it makes it even more difficult for somebody like me who wants to do the best thing possible. But instantly, my labor rates are 30 to 40 percent higher. That's our number one cost within um, within a restaurant is your labor rate. Uh, and I can't compete, you know, like we do all of these things. So I have sustainable packaging, we have a composting program, we source fairly and locally, we have wage programs. And if I use the same model that you would use in the standard restaurant for profitability, I would have to charge 18 to $19 per plate, which just isn't sustainable overall for a community or the business. So it, it's a very difficult road to try and find that place where you can be share the resource uh, and be a community positive individual and still be profitable within this capitalist system. Um, so I am full so for supporting $15 an hour. I'd like to see minimum wage across the board be a living wage. 
Uh, but of course, our biggest industry uh, lobbying groups, their first thing to do is start lobbying against $15 an hour. Uh, so we, we got kicked out of a bunch of different groups because we went against that grain. We didn't think oh. it was possible to, to do sustainably. Tyson, Sorry, Stephanie, you, it looks like you had a question. I'm curious more about the living wages in terms of how common are they across you know, the region? Uh, within the direct food industry, I don't know of any other restaurant that has living wages. Uh, when you go into a food producer, so, uh, when you have a bakery, like if you're a secondary producer, it becomes easier because you can, your costs are a little bit different and your market's a little bit different. So bakeries, I know Ambrosia, I know Redo That, uh, Ghost Light, I know Aroma Cafe, um, all are sustainably, uh, wage driven. And that might have. Sometimes that's within their tips as well. They might be doing something within um, their program to offer a bigger wage. That's also a bit of an issue where other places have taken tips and then converted them to wages, uh, which is really not very uh, ethical to do, um, as well as it has tax implications for your employees, but it's a way for the business to advertise that they have fair wages. Meanwhile, there's another level of exploitation going on. So... I think among the food industry, I can't think of a single restaurant. I don't think there's a single restaurant that has a living wage policy um, outside of tips. It's just the industry is so skewed against that and the pressure to keep labor down. Um, but it's also going to take more of the market to really support it. So a lot of times we don't think about why a coffee from me is $2.50 and why a Tim Hortons coffee is $1.75. Um, so we think about the ingredients or the volume, but again, one of the big things is the average, I just saw a report on Tim Hortons or TDL Ontario, their average hourly wage is $13.76 across their whole industry, which is 75 cents below the minimum wage but because of other policies that the government supports like student uh, and, and alcohol wages, that overall wage has gone less. And then we get into the other issue of piecemeal work in places like Uber or um, you know, the, the gig economy, uh, which is also starting to happen in foods. It sounds wonderful. And then you start to realize how exploitive that is as well. So it's, uh, there would be an incredible standard for for the industry to set to one raise wages. Like if it got raised to $15 an hour minimum, I could go to living wages across the board because I'd be able to sustainably keep our business um, within the same, you know, maybe a 10% premium, not a 30% premium on our prices. And Ben, is the lowering of minimum wage with the tipping only for coffee shops? No, it's for any kind of, uh, so there's two ways that you lower the minimum wage. Anybody who hires a student, and that student could be university, high school, college, continuing education also qualifies in Ontario, means you can pay them $13.40 an hour. And if you have an alcohol license, so this is any restaurant, any coffee shop with an alcohol license, a wine bar, uh, any, kind of, any kind of alcohol business or any kind of business that has an alcohol license, their minimum wage is $12.25 and it is being raised to $12.40. So yay, Ontario. That's really, I used to work as a server at a, at a place at the BAMP Center and uh, I used to be the breakfast part and I knew all the servers and the bartenders from the evening and they made a ton in tips. And then I actually got to find out some of their wages that they were actually making more than me too because they were more valuable to the company. So not only did I not get tips in the morning at breakfast, but and started at the same wage as them, but I never got overtime because my day stopped at midday, whereas they went into the evening. And you know, like it's I never really realized the the difference in benefits. Um, and I experienced it. And uh, but the one thing I was thinking about too also is that with the food industry. I got a lot of benefits from work in the form of food. Um, they gave me a meal and that was a really high quality meal. They gave me, um, there was always toast 
and bread and milk and all sorts of other stuff in a one fridge that anybody had access to any day, any time of the night sort of thing. And then they had meals that were free to the staff and whatever. So I think in a food industry, you do have that opportunity to provide an, another benefit that goes along with the wage because um, this week we, I read a paper and it was discussing how even those with low income, even at minimum wage or around what you're discussing at the $16 an hour, those people are already marginalized. They're not able to save. Maybe you have a family. So they were saying that healthy, sustainable, accessible food is not really part of their budget still. Um, the access to uh, emergency food banks and those sorts of things amongst that demographic is still quite high in this region. Um, and so I really think the refrigerator outside is a cool and an amazing way for us to be able to contribute to that. And I was wondering if you knew what are the, the barriers for the region or other places? Why is it? And I understand that most of these really cool things start grassroots and small um, private industry driven. But how is it that we can ask the region to make more fridges accessible in other places, especially where we have food deserts in places where it's hard to walk to food and those things? Because I really think, I don't know, the way that you've been talking, I've been really hearing agriculture and the culture of food is what you're talking about. You want to bring arts into culture of food and those sorts of things. And here community is culture and those sorts of things are being built by these fridges. But um, yeah, how can we try to take that to the to the public sector and what are the barriers there? And like, wow, I didn't know, like because of the Banff Center, we had a compost program and because we were in the mountains and they're really concerned about all their garbage. But I had no idea, boom, that you guys, there's no compost program that the region runs. Like, bam, that's, that's why aren't you making dirt and selling it, right? Like those sorts of things. So yeah, I'll, I'll let you respond, but I was, Thank you for everything you've said. Uh, I didn't go into the food. Uh, for us, I mean, it, that's pretty standard. If you run a reputable operation, you're going to give free food to your employees. We also extend that all of our employees can purchase from our suppliers at 5% invoice cost. Um, all of our employees also get a 50% discount when they're off. Um, and, I, you know, that benefit, it's hard to quantify what that means per hour. But again, it's a way of supporting our community because I know uh, a few of my employees probably eat 50% of their meals at the cafe because they can't afford to buy sustainable food or healthy organic food. It just, it's, it's not possible. And I think that's more systemic to the actual industry itself, uh, where for whatever reason, they're still able to hire you as an employee, knowing that they're going to pay you less and your tip out's going to be less and you were happy to do it. We still have, we need this worker revolution. And I think it's starting to happen now where the pressure to get employees, because when the serve's been available and we're paying people a basic benefit, um, and it's not, again, not a sustainable amount of money, but it's you know covering off what somebody's gonna make at a minimum wage role. It's putting pressure for everybody to raise their wages, which means we might have to raise our prices by 10 or 20% which would be fantastic because that in turn is going to come back to us in the sense of the community itself. So with the fridges, part of the problem when you have any kind of program like this for the regional, so I'm also involved in a bunch of indigenous, indigenous um, like boards that we're trying to get things started now because there's a huge appetite to support indigenous based organizations. So we have a market right now. The issue is though that you don't go for a thousand dollars you go for a million dollars, which means you have to have a board in place, which means you have to have a full outline of how you're going to create whatever environment you want to have and how you're going to deliver and implement that environment. Uh, and that takes thousands of hours of work and dedication of volunteers before anything even gets put out there. Most of the things that have happened, like Community Fridge KW is part of a larger organization of community fridges. Another one is 519 Community Fridge, uh, which is just, these are two groups that kind of organically came from the community because there's been the need that has been seen that we have food deserts, we have food scarcity uh, within our community. And these things have, have started. 
the biggest limitation to it though is people willing to host the fridge so because of where i am with the bakery i didn't have to ask anybody for permission where i am in downtown kitchener there's no way that my land developer is going to let me put an outside resource for a fridge because they view that community that's going to use it even though when you stand outside the fridge yes there's some people that come that may have uh, a drug issue or a substance issue uh, or may have a mental health issue i would say the vast overwhelming majority of people that come there are people that have a food issue so they might even be driving up in a car and during covid if you're getting served great your basic bills might be paid you may not lose your house or your place to live or your car but what gets sacrificed is food so you look at places like the dollar store becoming um, your primary calorie resource uh, and that's not healthy it's not healthy for it's going to cost us more later on within the healthcare system uh, and then all the other areas of marginalization that we pay for, all of those things are going to happen there. And the largest issue, though, for this is people willing to host the fridges. There are donors. There's donors in place. Um, for example, in our community, one place is the 519 Community Collective. They have, in just two years, without a board, without any government funding, just with basically a pe people from a church and an idea, I think now support three fridges, something like 20 pantries where you can go up and they have dry goods in them. Uh, and they're located throughout the city, as well as a food hamper program, backpack program, lunch program, uh, and, and like a nutrition for learning program. All of these things are already here. The community is willing to support it. It takes more of this connection between industry to support it as well. Instead of us thinking, well, those aren't our customers. Right. This is how typically businesses think is, well, that's not my customer base and it might offend my customer base. So I can't do it versus the, it, it's a lot harder to say that's not my community. That's not my community base. And when you start looking at your overall impact of where you are as a community, it gets a lot easier. So I think the biggest way that we can do that is start lobbying the places that we go to and tell them that we want to support this. So if you happen to be in Waterloo, there's been very strong opposition to another community fridge. There used to be one zero waste bulk hosted it downtown. The landowner for zero waste bulk said, no, you can't have this anymore uh, because other people complained or I don't know if there's vandalism or what happened, but they basically said no. So lobbying other businesses that you support where they say, oh yeah, we're community minded, let's go. We're all here together great, put your money where your mouth is and host a community fridge. And that support is going to come or that pressure is going to come from the community demanding that it happens. And then we would look at larger things. If we continue to see that we have a need for food, I hope somebody at the region would realize maybe we have to get more sustainable within how we're facing food scarcity because the food bank, again, although it's an incredible resource, it has become an industry upon itself. Uh, and you as an individual can't just go to the food bank and pick up food. That's probably one of the largest barriers to the food bank now is that it has to be distributed through another organization. And that takes logistics and time and it isn't always accessible. And then we run into the other oppositions that you face within a marginalized community. So I think the biggest way to make that impact isn't so much with a regional or a provincial governments, although there's large systemic issues that we have to face. The bigger one is as a community, if we cry out for it, that public pressure will change. Yeah, Tyson, I think that's a really interesting point in terms of us just thinking about what do we expect, you know, in terms of services provided by government versus by charity versus by, you know, individual citizens stepping up and supporting each other. So I think you're definitely giving a, a good picture of like where some of the gaps are and what you know community members are, are able to do. I remember hearing from some people when the community fridges started like, oh, that's just a terrible idea. They're gonna have so many food safety problems, right? But my understanding is that there's, you know, that they get cleaned and they get checked and rotated, you know, on a really regular basis. And if there's anything that's starting to not look good or not be healthy, 
it's going to get taken away and it's like unfortunately most of the food is the fridges are empty before there's ever a chance for them to go bad um so there's a definite need for them but i i mean there's a larger issue here as well for example food not bombs okay was declared a terrorist organization in this country just let that one sink in for a second because they're a radical group because they're a radical group that operated outside of the norms of what a charity should operate as and were trying to provide food okay they were and they were radical but because of their basis in radicalism were deemed a terrorist organization uh and we actually had a lobby in downtown kitchener about eight nine years ago where food not bombs was banned from downtown kitchener because they were offering food to people and that was creating more people were coming to get the food from them and it was very visible. So people went, well, that's got to be a terrible organization. And the business owners of downtown Kitchener, thankfully, most of them are gone now because it's backfired terribly on them. Um, but they were advocating the city to ban anybody from using the city hall grounds for distribution of food or clothing. They said that it impacted their customers' enjoyment of the downtown. And, you know, sadly, in some ways they were right, because when you look at the gentrification and what's happened with downtown, uh, you know, all the people with money have kind of won. But I was also very happy to see four of those businesses close when the community around them went, what, what, what? You know what, maybe people that want to drive their BMWs from Waterloo down to Kitchener because they think it's going to be a cheap deal should just stay in, in Waterloo and let Kitchener do Kitchener. I, it's, I, and I'm sorry, I think a lot of you are in Waterloo right now, but down here in little Kitchener, we've been the, like Waterloo was always research in motion and universities and a beautiful downtown that was like just the perfect gentrification station. So in Kitchener, we've joked for a long time that, hey, if you want to live in Waterloo, get yourself a BMW. If you want to live in Kitchener, get yourself a bike lock. And I think that is the big difference between the two communities. And we're seeing those things play out now as Kitchener, um, like I said, gentrification is hit has very hard. Um, but with the tech sector coming here and how we've seen the community grow, Unfortunately, we've also lost some of the responsibility that we have to that community. And these huge companies coming down are just starting to realize now that by building these buildings and who they've evicted and the smaller places that they've torn down uh, have a bigger cultural impact on the city and they're starting to take responsibility for that. For example, we were offered a space. Um, somebody came to us and said, look, we really wanna have community. Uh, we realize how important a place like you is, like you are to the downtown. Can we save your business with a year of free rent and give you a place at below market rent because we believe in you? And I was like, yeah, you sure can. Uh, I was, they wanted to buy community and I was willing to sell community. But at the same time, that's come with some, some things that they may not have been so happy about, like having live entertainment, having, um, we actually have a food distribution program that we have set up. Um, or things like forcing them that they have, a, have to have a compost program or another one for us is our front door is not, uh, an accessible door. It doesn't have a power, uh, button so that you can open it from, from, uh, with any kind of, uh, limited mobility. So we're forcing our building owner to, uh, put this in for us. And again, I think somebody else might not have cared about that as much or not really cared about the community. It would have been a problem for it, but because they wanted us and bought us, we're forcing them to do some things as well. Oh, and one thing we talked about was the compostable program not being in Waterloo. There's no recycling program either for businesses. So unless your business is front facing on King Street and you can put out the little blue box, there's no industrial uh, blue box system. So again, these are things that when we came in, we we're like, okay, so where do we compost? And they were like, well, we don't have a compost program. Well, you better get one. You wanted us. You have to have one for this building uh, as well as the recycling uh, program. And thankfully, Perimeter uh, probably hates us at this point, 
but have been incredible to work with because they have implemented and understand the need to implement these kind of programs um, for us. So that started to impact their other businesses that they have renting from them. For example, uh, the Marche downtown, the new grocery store, uh, also now has a compost and recycling program because of what we started with Perimeter. I'm curious, ties in, in other cities, you know, in Ontario or elsewhere in Canada, are recycling and composting programs common or is this pretty typical? It's in some places they are where the BIAs within those regions have realized that this is an impact and it's a way to make your core stand out because you know what? Some shopping malls do it and it's based all over it. So if you go to Fairway down in Kitchener has nothing. Conestoga has a full program. You actually see that they have um, they they have alternative energy sources as well. And these are part of the branding that they have for that location. So BIAs have taken that. Business improvement areas are your um, kind of, they take part of your taxes and help support the business that's developing in those areas. Uh, so for example, like Guelph, has it from the government but that's Guelph. Guelph's a very special place in all of Canada I think it is kind of unique in that way where Kitchener did have one through our BIA um, before COVID there was something they were starting with the working center and La Hacienda which was a program to take organics bring them back and then produce energy from them. Uh, and that program, so again, these pilot programs happen, but they more happen because the businesses say that we have to do it, or somebody within an organization has the leadership and say, well, this could be a great benefit to you and your business, something that you can promote. So again, we always think of that $100 out, I've got to get $1,000 back in business, um, but it's something that you can promote. And those kind of uh, programs, again, have been grassroots sprung. Um, but they do exist. However, the very few of them exist from a government supported standpoint. Yeah. So, do you yeah. see scope for sustainable water the region to be stepping in and advocating for some of that kind of stuff? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I think more the education part is more people understand this uh, and a parallel for it is as an indigenous person, uh, we have more visibility than we've ever had before. And it's causing, um, I mean, some of it's very patronizing in terms of tokenism and things like that that we're seeing. There's, there's problems with it, but we have a heightened visibility now. So issues that are facing Indigenous people have become to the forefront. And that's because of public support. Uh, you know, to, on Thursday is Orange Shirt Day and we have a national holiday in this country where more people are going to support that holiday than government supporting that holiday. And that kind of change needs to happen within our sustainable systems as well. When people realize the amount of energy that it goes to go into a coffee cup and what it takes to break it down and that plastic lid that you get from Tim Hortons is gonna be here forever. You know, 10,000 years seems like forever. Uh, understanding that you know, will help change the overall market. And when the market changes, it becomes a lot more, uh, it's a lot easier to implement those changes because people will see, oh, okay, it's 50 cents more, great, but I'm not going to be killing something. That becomes important. So I think groups like all the advocacy groups, the more pressure we put on public education, right? is is probably the biggest piece we can do it we're business people we're great at finding solutions what we need to have is support to make those solutions viable um for example i bet probably nobody here has a bottle of nestle water in front of them right we've made a decision that we will never have <laughs> uh that we will never have a nestle product and in the coffee industry that's really hard because uh, everybody wants to have a sparkling water. Well, San Pellegrino, Montpellier, and Perrier are all Nestle products. They are all products that are pumped out of Aberfoyle in this region, along with the plastic water bottles. But as we become more of an advocate, people now are realizing the impact that Nestle is having um, to, our, to, our, um, to our water systems here. People are starting to turn away from it. 
And yeah, you're always going to see somebody buy that 24 pack for $4 at the grocery store, but our customer demands are starting to change. So now we have a, a bottle of water and a biodegradable bottle that we have to charge $2 for, but customers are willing to pay that $2 because the knowledge is becoming that they have to, like, you can't buy this stuff because there's a, and an output on the other end that we're not paying for yet. That's so because that's become public knowledge, that's starting to change the market. And when the market changes, those are how we can, we can come to meet that market. So that's where I think advocacy groups can have the biggest impact because again, industry, we're industry. We're going to figure stuff out on our own. What we need is the market to change so that we can meet the market um, when it's coming to us. Is industry paying for their garbage disposal already then? So because they're not having it taken in a recycling or these programs, um, is it not beneficial or when the business improvement industries or districts or whatever, that when they come together to do this, is it not just that they're benefiting on economies of scale to have a, a district, like to, to get, manage the waste of recycling and all these things does not, not make it cheaper in the end? Or is it still just as cheap to let the, the city take your dumpster as many often times as you want? So for most, for most industrial places, you don't get garbage service from the city. There is no garbage service. So that becomes your landowner issue. So if you own the building, then you're going to be responsible for your own waste disposal in most cases, unless you're in a place like us where, uh, no, I guess they own the building, so they're responsible for, for waste disposal. Um, the BIA more sponsored the program uh, for the compost by uh, subsidizing it through, um, through a return. So I was paying about a quarter of what we would pay for typical uh, compost removal uh, because of this BIA program. But what it was was the industry came forward and said, look, we're going to have this program. We have this pilot program to create energy from waste. Um, so we have this, uh, we have this private industry wants to create waste. How can we support it with the downtown businesses? They provided the subsidy. BIEs aren't large organizations. So to try and take on the administration and logistics of a garbage program throughout a whole area, as well as then you're responsible for accounting, you're responsible for bill payment, collection, those things. It's just not really within their scope that they're able to do it. Uh, so it's more that as a business, you demand it, or you turn around and just pay for it because your customers demand it. So it's, yeah, there is no city, um, there is no city garbage, like regional, sorry, garbage pickup and waste management is a regional uh, program. And that is not provided for businesses. It's only provided for residences. I don't know if I answered your question, but I think so. I had a whole bunch of texts come in at the same time. No, Somebody's yeah, that, burning, I think. That, that definitely answered the question. And it makes it understanding <laughs> that like, they just thought oh, what somebody else's problem and somebody else is moving the dumpster and it's getting paid for efficiently. So because it's, it's done that way. And like you said, it, it'd be a whole other business to group all of that garbage together and try to make it more efficient. And, uh, and that's a little unfortunate, but I guess at the same sense, like you said, it comes back to demand. And so that if the customers are seeing and asking for it, then the, the, the owners have to make the change because the businesses are requesting it. So it's a little bit of a slower process, but it's actually getting things done. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of happened across it, uh, across the board. So uh, you see, for example, the airline industries, uh, airline industry always now is partnered with a green offsetting. It's not required that you purchase a carbon offset for your flight, but the fact that it's there, people that are like-minded in the market starting to change, somebody like me is going to buy that because it just becomes part of your cost. Why would I offload that to somebody else? I realize that my responsibilities are there. Uh, and that those kind of changes, so whether it be for sustainable energy production, uh, as a business, we, we, you know, we go through a lot of um, power every month and we've demanded that our building have a sustainable power program, uh, which are actually working with, uh, there's two in the area and they've just switched over so that we can say that our power is being um, provided from 
an ulterior source as opposed to just a straight generation. And I think again, the market is starting to come uh, here so that all of these programs are out there and businesses can adopt them because their customers are demanding them as well. So two more questions uh, that I just got here. Uh, it's actually, so BIE is typically stands for business improvement area, not association. I don't know why they have that. I think it's because it's a city run organization, but I always thought it was association. It's actually area. Uh, and then, so one thing that has been affecting um, part of our supply chain, and we really noticed this last year, and this was spurred on having a market at uh, our bakery the reason we have a farmer's market at our bakery is because the farmer's market closed. And we realized that uh, customers want to have access to farmers. So we have a bunch of farmers that come to us on Saturday. They don't pay anything to be there. We just ask that they're there consistently every Saturday and they are. Uh, but it was important to us again, to serve our community, looking outside of what is my direct dollar input, my direct dollar result, or sorry, dollar result. Uh, it was important that we have um, that community connection and the connection to food. And that was disrupted because of COVID. But we've seen that same thing throughout uh, just about every um, silo within product distribution or product uh, warehousing. So we saw, and some of it's been very negative um, because there hasn't been a market outside of large commercial organizations like grocery stores, we're seeing farmers take produce and throw them back to the fields because they don't have a distribution source for them. So tomatoes, for example, um, there are fields full of tomatoes out in Elmer that were just never able to be produced to market. And that limitation was there are no markets available for them to be produced at. So there was the market end that we had an issue with. Uh, then within the distribution channel itself, because of COVID safety protocols, the food terminal, for example, was closed off. You had to order by a uh, order foam. So it really required everybody to um, limit what you were ordering because the time for your supplier to be there uh, was exponential in terms of their cost. So where before they could just go and go, okay, I'm gonna pick up this and this and this, then now they had to fill out a form and wait three or four hours. So that became, another block within distribution. And then we had market demands that just weren't, weren't forethought. Um, for example, as everybody turned to takeout and delivery, um, those products for delivering that product were not available. So we have run into more issues with scarcity in terms of biodegradable cups, compostable cups, because the great part is the market is starting to demand this. And we're seeing if you got food delivered five, six times a week, you're realizing the garbage and waste that it's producing. So there was a demand that people go to sustainable packaging, uh, which is incredible, but it's also meant that a lot of times we've had to scramble and try and get something from Windsor or Vancouver and drop ship to us. Um, so yeah, all sorts of issues like that. The producers, thankfully so far, we've been pretty good but it's been more the packaging. They've run out of bottles or they don't have a truck that can drive. Um, those kind of things have been more of the distribution issues um, or just huge market things like toilet paper and everybody buying it. Uh, okay, and then I got asked a question about Big Land. So as an indigenous person, um, I'm starting to learn my culture and ceremony a lot more. And one of the projects I'm involved with is something called uh, an indigenous food sovereignty group and or Indigenous Food Sovereignty Collective. And what this is, is basically using traditional growing production models that Indigenous people have used for thousands of years that are very sustainable. Some of you may have heard of the Three Sisters planting method. Um, it was really popular on TikTok. Basically what it is, is using a field in the complete opposite way that we grow agriculture right now. If you drive out, to any of our fields out, and we have lots of them surrounding us, uh, you will see little signs for things like Pioneer, Roundup, um, Stega, and basically go out to any of these fields, grab a shovel, go dig some soil, and there is nothing alive in the field. There are no bugs, there is no plants, there is no off-season growth, there's nothing. That soil is dead. And how we traditionally farm is re- plant seeds that have been modified 
so that they can accept one uh, kind of um, herbicide uh, or insecticide and it'll kill everything else except that plant. And then we just continually add fertilizer to it. It's not very long-term sustainable. It's doing things like we're gonna see within 10 or 15 years, um, the complete lack of oxygen within the Great Lakes because we're seeing the runoff of these fields and this overproduction of, um, overproduction of fertilizers hitting those systems. In the exact opposite way, uh, indigenous people have been growing for thousands of years. Uh, and the three sisters planting is where we take three plants that are synergistic together. So we have corn, squash, and uh, beans. The beans use the corn and grow up, but the leaves of the bean help protect the corn and they secure the soil so that you don't have the erosion. And squash grows around the bottom of the uh, plants again to help keep moisture within that raised bed. Uh, as well as protect the roots uh, from both insects as well as um, as well as drought or in this year we've had so much water um, complete opposite to other places and the idea of growing like this is not new the best part about it is at the end of the year nothing has to happen to that field all the parts that each plant has taken out of the field have been replaced by the other plants in synergy the issue is that it's very labor intensive. And for us, a thousand years ago, we had nothing but labor. There was no social media. There really was no jobs we had to go do. The job was to produce food and live. So it became very easy. Now we're trying to do the same thing again. And the traditional farmer will look at it and go, well, where would you drive a tractor? How do you harvest this? And that is part of the issue is that it's not the norm that we have but these are the traditional ways that we're going to have to go back to to help support um, the ecosystem that we live in to support us so it's that same kind of synergy as a business i need the community because the community is going to support me as a business it's the same thing for our agriculture system um, and the biggest issue there is because people feel that it's very labor intensive uh, and it is we lose labor as a, or we, we don't consider labor as anything other than a resource for, for financial gain. That kind of whole thinking has to be changed. And that's what's going to help clean up the water on the ground. That's what's going to help secure our banks for our water systems. That's what's going to help return our fields. Um, those are the, you know, this idea that we're going back to these traditional methods because when people came here, we, First, when, when the first set or not sellers, when the first explorers, let's call them, came to Turtle Island, we sent them home with abundance because we had abundance. Um, we never had food scarcity. We didn't have, you know, the, the harsh climate issues that we faced, we were able to deal with. And we have roles within our community. For example, I'm something called a firekeeper. And part of that role is for me to go into a forest and understand what's going on with the forest and how to control what's going there. And if it was a super dry year, maybe that means that we have to move our whole uh, community and protect it, as opposed to trying to just change the forest. Those two things aren't in synergy. We need to change what we do as opposed to changing the ecosystem. And hopefully that idea starts to change a little bit more. And that was the idea of Big Land. Oh, you've um, given up so much uh, today, Tyson. And um, I just... Yeah, so appreciative. So many different directions. Uh, and I think it's like <laughs> I, I would love to say that it was just one small area, but when you run a business like this and your idea is to be sustainable, <laughs> that sustainability comes in so many areas. And it's hard not to separate them because we tend to think of sustainable as only an environmental issue or only a packaging issue or only a logistics and distribution issue. And really sustainable should mean all of those things together. And what is the reason that we're running a business? You know, is it purely for profit? That's not sustainable. You know, there's, if we're always gonna be taking, there's no inputs to come back. Or if you look at sustainability, we're hoping to get a profit by continually giving back. Yeah. Well, you've encapsulated everything that we're trying to cover in this course in, in, in one guest speaker. That's a lot of bang for our buck. And we aren't even paying you, but we're, we're going to patronize your restaurant. Thank you, Tyson. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks for Thanks being here. You guys have a great day.